Hi, this is Oba King. Welcome to my channel. Today, I want to just offer a theological response to the rape and murder of Uyne Namkhoitian. The news cycle has currently been bombarding us with images of violence in the wake of the harrowing reality that South Africa does not belong to all those who live in it, as the Freedom Charter asserted. It does not belong to the African foreign nationals. It does not belong to women. Today, I want to respond to the MI Next movement, a movement that started in response to the exclusion of the female body, a movement that started in response to Wina Namkhoitiana's death. I want to attempt to answer a question that must not be asked and yet demands to be answered. What drives a black man to commit such a grotesque act of violence? This question must not be asked because it can very easily turn into a justification of an unjustifiable act of violence. However, it also demands to be answered because for far too long our response to a senseless act of violence has been a conspiracy of silence. In an attempt to understand this phenomenon of gender-based violence, I turned to Steve because I write what I like. He perceptively surmised that the problem of oppression goes deeper than political and economic disenfranchisement. Rather, it is a problem of spiritual poverty. Biko says, material want is bad enough, but coupled with spiritual poverty, it kills. And this latter effect is probably the one that creates mountains of obstacles in the normal course of emancipation. For long, we have failed to connect social issues that we face with spiritual poverty. Spiritual poverty goes far beyond merely having a low self-esteem, even though that is a big part of it. Spiritual poverty colors the social interactions and conditions the patterns of social relation that we have as a society. To look at Uyne Namkhoitiana's death as an exception is to make a grave mistake. It is the rule. Everyone knows of somebody that has been raped. And on a daily basis, there's a woman who gets raped and murdered. South Africa is in a state of metaphysical catastrophe. Metaphysical catastrophe is the naturalization of war zone conditions. When Biko describes the effects of colonial apartheid on the black man, he says, deep inside, his anger mounts at the accumulating insults, but he wants to vent in the wrong direction. On his fellow men in the township, on the property of black people. This explains the spate of violence that we see in the form of xenophobic attacks and gender-based violence. The ultimate description of an oppressed black man is when Biko says, all in all, the black man has become a shell, a shadow of a man completely defeated, drowning in his own misery, a slave, an ox bearing the yoke of oppression with sheepish timidity. This type of a man is a man that fails to recognize the humanity of a woman and respect the sanctity of life and understand the importance of consent. Because analysis was an incisive diagnosis of the situation that he was living in. We, however, are living in a democratic dispensation. How can I turn to Biko in order to understand our situation today? Well, that is because we are living in a state of coloniality. First, whites came and dispossessed blacks of their land. This is colonialism. Then they set up a government to maintain colonialism. That is colonization. Now, the state is well developed and can benefit them even in the hands of a black government. This is coloniality. This means we are living under colonial conditions, but they have been masqueraded as democracy and freedom. 
This means that the conditions that made a shadow of a man in the lifetime of Iko are still alive and well today. The difference is that now it is more difficult to point out what those conditions are. Why have I been talking straight up politics with you instead of looking into the Bible? I did say after all that this is a theological response. To answer this question, I want to briefly consider the identity involvement dilemma as articulated by Jürgen Moltmann. He says, The Christian life of theologians, churches, and human beings is faced more than ever today with a double crisis, the crisis of relevance and the crisis of identity. These two crises are complementary. The more theology and the church attempt to be relevant to the problems of today, the more deeply they are drawn into a crisis of their own Christian identity. The more they attempt to assert their identity in traditional dogmas, rites, and moral notions, the more irrelevant and unbelievable they become. The dilemma articulated by Moltmann puts to question how relevant our religious practices are if they do not address the conditions we live in. I call this dilemma to our attention because I think there are some productive tensions that we can harness. In November 1990, a conference took place in Rustenburg. This conference was attended by South African churches. This resulted in what is known today as the Rustenburg Declaration, which I would like to quote one of the confessions from. We therefore confess that we have in different ways practiced, supported, permitted, or refused to resist apartheid. Some of us misused the Bible to justify apartheid, leading many to believe that it was the sanction of God. Later, we insisted that its motives were good even though its effects were evil. Our slowness to denounce apartheid as sin encouraged the government to retain it. Some of us ignored apartheid's evil, spiritualizing the gospel by preaching the sufficiency of the individual salvation without social transformation. We adopted an allegedly neutral stance which in fact resulted in complicity with apartheid. We were often silent when our sisters and brothers were suffering persecution. This is a damning admission by the Christian community in South Africa, and it remains true to this day. It is an admission of irrelevance to the South African problem. South Africa has a problem of rape culture. And if we as a church do not take part in the official stance against rape culture, not only are we irrelevant, we are complicit. The church as an institution will continue to lose relevance, credibility, and moral authority if it does not respond to the scientific, social, and political reality of the world around it. Our task, therefore, is not merely to keep the Sabbath. Rather, our task is to mediate Sabbath justice and meditate on what it means to worship on Sabbath after an unsuspecting woman got raped and killed. Our task is also to ask ourselves if it is possible for one to call themselves a Christian and yet they can ignore the injustices that are happening in society. How will history judge us? History will judge whether we responded to these questions or not. In our push, for social relevance, however, we do risk becoming a chameleon, always taking the colors of the environment in order to adapt and remain unnoticed. Are we not risking moving into no man's land where some organization might come and subsume the Christian community? The answer to this question is complicated. To be a Christian is risky business. To identify yourself as a Christian is to follow the example of Christ and to follow the path of non-identity. Jesus identified with the poor, 
the sinners, the women, the unclean, and many others that society had rejected. Jesus' life and ministry sought to center the experience of marginality. Let us for a moment consider Paul's words to the Philippian church in Philippians 2 verse 5 to verse 8. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ, who, being in the form of God, considered it not robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bond servant, coming in the likeness of man, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Christian identity can be understood only as an act of identification with the crucified Christ. To the extent to which one has accepted the proclamation that in him, God has identified himself with the godless. The road Christ walked was a road of non-identity. The road of non-identity is a road that requires radical faith. To explain radical faith, I turn to Paulo Freire. Freire describes a radical person in the following terms. The radical, committed to human liberation, does not become a prisoner to a circle of certainty within which reality is also imprisoned. On the contrary, the more radical a person is, the more fully he or she enters into reality, knowing it better, he or she can better transform it. The radical in this instance means one who goes to the root of the matter. Radical faith is faith that enters into reality to the fullest extent. Faith is in fact a radical encounter with reality. If there is anything to learn from the life of Jesus, is that to be heavenly bound is not to be earthly useless. Rather, a life of true faith is one that seeks to do the will of God on earth as it is in heaven. God emptied himself in Jesus, becoming a human. He further emptied himself of social status and became a carpenter. Ultimately, he emptied himself of dignity when he died on the cross. Earlier I mentioned that our task as Christians is not merely to worship, rather to also ask what the meaning of our worship is in an unjust society. I want to invite you to reflect with me on what the crucifixion means in the wake of the hashtag and my next movement. We are the body of Christ. In order to properly appreciate this proposition, we need to look at the hidden script. The public script is a curated image of what, for instance, we put online or we present to the public. The hidden script, on the other hand, is the scandalous parts of our lives, the parts that we don't want people to see, the ugly side of life. The hidden script of the church is no different. There is a grotesque part of the body of Christ that we do not want to look at. Members of the body of Christ are raped and killed on a daily basis. Worse still, people who claim to be members of the body of Christ rape and kill. Our Christology falls short if it does not answer the question, what does the crucifixion of Jesus mean after the rape and murder of Uyina Namkhwetyan? Who is Christ to the victims of gender-based violence. I want to submit to you that unless we see Winene in the wounded body of Christ, unless we hear her cry in the cry of Jesus when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Then we have not yet begun to understand who the crucified Christ is. Believing in Jesus means we show that the responsibility of the past in the here and now in memory of the crucified Christ and all the victims of history. Because I believe in Jesus, I stand in solidarity with all the children, women, and men that have been raped and murdered. My belief in Jesus puts a responsibility on my shoulders to honor the memory of the forgotten. I need to honor the memory of the unrememberable names of victims of history. I stand in solidarity with the MI Next movement. This has been Oba Game. Please share, like, subscribe, and share your thoughts 
on this theological response. Thank you.